This is a video about the third required practical activity in GCSE Biology and Combined Science, the osmosis investigation. By the end of this video, you should know what is meant by osmosis, you should be able to describe how to set up the osmosis required practical, and you should also be able to explain how to interpret the results of that practical. For GCSE Biology, you need to be familiar with three different transport mechanisms that are used to move materials into and out of cells, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. The first thing you should know about osmosis is that it is always the movement of water. No other substances ever move by osmosis. The second thing you should know is that the water will move from where there's a lot of it in what we call a dilute solution to where there's less of it in a concentrated solution. Now, the crucial thing here is the concentration. In other words, the ratio between the solute, the thing that's dissolved, and the water. So the water will move until equilibrium is reached but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are the same number of water molecules on either side of the membrane. What it means is that each water molecule has the same number of solute particles associated with it. So if we start off with a very large difference in concentration, we're going to end up with a very large difference in the number of water molecules, because lots and lots of water molecules will move to where there's lots and lots of solute. The other thing you need to know is that osmosis will only occur where we have a partially permeable membrane. Permeable basically means wholly, and then partially means that only certain substances can move through it. And that might be because of their size or their polarity or any number of reasons. But basically what's going to happen is that the water is able to move through that partially permeable membrane, but the other things that are in that solution, the solute, are not able to move. So I know it's early, but time for a quick progress check. Pause the video and make sure that you can answer these two questions. During osmosis, it's always water that moves, and that water will move from a dilute solution where there's lots of water to a concentrated solution where there's less water. In required practical three, we're investigating the effect of a range of concentrations of either a salt solution or a sugar solution on the mass of some pieces of plant tissue. So typically this would be chips of potato, but you could also use apple or swede or carrot or something completely different. As with all of your required practicals, you're expected to be able to identify what the independent, dependent and control variables are. The independent variable is the thing that we're changing. So in this investigation, I'm going to have a number of different tubes and each one will have a different concentration of the salt solution or the sugar solution. Then the dependent variable is the thing that I'm observing or measuring to see what happens. So as I use each one of those sugar solutions, what effect does that have on the mass of the plant tissue? Then the control variables are the things that need to be identical between the different repeats. And this is because otherwise I won't have valid data. If I change more than one thing at once, I won't know what has triggered the effect that I see. So in this investigation, I'm going to keep the same source of plant tissue. In other words, I'm going to make all of my chips out of the same potato. I'm going to use the same type of solution. So although the concentration is changing, if I'm using a salt solution, it will be salt for every single one. I'm not going to use salt for some and sugar for a different one. I'm going to leave all of the pieces of plant tissue for the same length of time. And then finally, in an ideal world, I would want to start with identical pieces of plant tissue. But the reality is that this is quite hard to achieve. So although I'm aiming for exactly the same starting mass, this isn't truly a control variable because I'm not actually going to force it to be identical. And instead, I'm going to use a little bit of maths to get around this later. When I start the investigation, I'll have nearly identical pieces of plant tissue sat in the different solutions. And then at the end of the investigation, I'm going to observe these and how they've changed will tell me something about the concentration of the fluid inside the cells of that plant. As you can see, the piece of plant tissue here on the left has got significantly larger and it will also have got heavier, while the piece on the right has got smaller and it's shriveled up. And in both of these instances, the reason that this has happened is osmosis. So in the left hand situation, the water is obviously a lot more dilute than the tissue inside of the cells of the piece of vegetable. And so because we know that in osmosis, water will move from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution, that water has moved from the water inside the cells. 
And so the cells have expanded, they've become more turgid and they've grown larger. And so therefore the left hand piece of vegetable matter has got bigger and heavier. In contrast to that, on the right hand side, we've got a more concentrated solution outside of the vegetable. So the salt solution is more concentrated than the um, fluid that's inside the cells. And so what's happened is that the water that is in those cells has been moved out by osmosis to kind of start diluting the salt solution. And so the cells of the vegetable have sort of shriveled up and become smaller and the piece of vegetable matter will have also become lighter in mass. So time for another progress check. Here we have some data from where a student has left three pieces of Swede in some pure water for 24 hours. And you've been given an initial mass and a final mass. So the question is, why have the masses of the Swede pieces changed? And this would be a three mark exam question. Pause the video and write down your thoughts now. So the reason is that the water has moved by osmosis. And as we can see, it's entered the cells and that's why they've got heavier. The reason that this has happened is that water always moves from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution, and there's nothing more dilute than pure water. And then this has happened across a partially permeable membrane, which I always want to mention when I'm discussing osmosis. In this investigation, we examine the change in mass of some pieces of potato. I have five different concentrations of the same solution, pre-measured in measuring cylinders for precision. These are then poured into individual boiling tubes and each tube will contain one piece of potato. The balance is used to measure the mass of the potato pieces at the start and the end of the investigation so that I can calculate the change in mass for each piece. And where the mass doesn't change, that tells me that the concentration is equal. In order to ensure that I have pieces that are as similar sized as possible, I use this piece of equipment called a cork borer and I insert this into the potato and this will help me to cut pieces that have a consistent diameter. I now use a ruler, forceps and a scalpel to cut five 10 millimetre pieces of potato to go into the five solutions. I measure the mass of each one using the balance. And this is important because even using the borer and the ruler, my pieces aren't actually identically sized. So I need to know what the mass is at the start so that I can work out the percentage change in mass. So my first piece has a mass of 0.42 grams, then 0.36. 0 0.28, 0.30, and finally 0.28. So each of those pieces is now being put into an individual tube with a solution of a different concentration, and those are going to be left for the same period of time. Having left the pieces of potato for half an hour, I'm now ready to measure the mass of each piece and see how it's changed. Before we measure the mass each time, we're going to dry it off quite thoroughly on a paper towel because it's really important that we're measuring the mass of just the potato and not the mass of the solution that's still stuck on the outside. So having dried this off, I can put it back on the balance and this one now has a mass of 0.54 grams. Also, I can compare it to my ruler and see that this is no longer 10 millimetres long. It's more like 12 millimetres, so it's got a little bit longer. And that's what we would expect because the cells have swollen and so the whole piece of potato has got a little bit larger. Then my second piece now has a mass of 0.46. My third piece now has a mass of 0.30. This piece that was in the 0.75 is now got a mass also of 0 0.30. And my final piece has a mass of 0 0.24. And that one I can see has also shrunk slightly, which again is what I would expect. In terms of results analysis, the first thing that you're likely to be asked to do is to work out the change in mass for each piece of potato. So this is just the difference between the final mass and the initial mass. So if I look at my first piece of potato that was in the pure water, that has increased in mass by 0.12 grams. 
And because I'm going to have both increases and decreases in this experiment, I'm going to indicate that more clearly by putting a plus sign in front of my number. If I then do the same for the subsequent pieces of potato, I can see that my second piece has also increased in mass, but not by quite as much. And my third piece has also increased in mass, but my fourth piece of potato hasn't actually changed mass at all, or at least not at the level of precision that I can detect with my balance. And then the final piece of potato that was in the one molar solution has decreased in mass. So here I indicate this with a minus sign. Now, of course, my five pieces of potato weren't all exactly the same mass to begin with. And actually, I had quite a lot of variation there because there was some variation in the diameter where the cork borer didn't work particularly well. And so in order to make the analysis make slightly more sense, I'm going to express each one of these mass changes as a percentage. So it won't matter how much the piece of potato originally weighed. We'll be able to see what percentage change there's been. Now, the way in which to do this is to take that mass change that I've just calculated and divide it by the initial mass. So we're saying what's 0.12 grams out of 0.42 grams. You can think of it like a fraction. And then because I want it as a percentage, I need to either use the percentage button on my calculator or just multiply it by 100. So for that first piece of potato, the mass has actually increased by 29%. And then for the second piece of potato, it's only increased by 28%. The third piece only by 7%. The fourth piece, of course, hasn't changed mass. And the final piece of potato has decreased in mass by 14%. So again, we've got those positive and negative numbers. And what those are indicating to me is that the mass has gone up for some of these pieces of potato and it's gone down for the others. And the difference here is based on whether the solution that they're in is more or less concentrated than the tissue fluid inside the potato cells. So for the first three solutions, they are more dilute than the tissue fluid, and that led water to move into the cells across the partially permeable membrane by osmosis. And then for the final piece of potato, the solution that it was in was more concentrated than the tissue fluid, and so that drew water out of the cells by osmosis across that partially permeable membrane. In addition to being asked to calculate the change in mass for each piece of potato and the percentage change in mass, you may be asked to plot this data onto a graph, draw a line of best fit and determine what the concentration of the fluid inside the cells is. It's obviously a little bit tricky for you to draw a graph for me, but we can get you to draw a line of best fit and work out the concentration. One thing that you should be aware of is that for the osmosis required practical, you're always expecting to see a graph like this in which you have some data above the X axis and that represents the pieces of potato that have increased in mass and then some data below the X axis. So those are the pieces of potato that have decreased in mass. And what we would expect is that where the concentration of the solution and the cells is equal, then there will be no change in mass at all. So pause the video and maybe just use a finger on the screen to indicate where you think the line of best fit should be and then see if you can calculate what the concentration of the fluid would be. So the important thing to remember here is that a line of best fit is a predictive line and it shows you the overall pattern of your data. And that means that although in GCSE maths you may have been told that you can only draw straight lines, in science we're interested in what the data are showing you. And here we don't have a beautiful straight line relationship, we actually have a slight curve. It doesn't need to go through every point, um, my curve here pretty much does, but it would be very common for you to have some points that were slightly to either side of this line. But they're, they're forming an overall curve rather than a straight line, and so your line should reflect that. Then in order to calculate the concentration of the tissue fluid, we need to find the point where the change in mass is zero. So this is where it crosses the x-axis. And although I haven't got minor grid lines here, we can agree that this is about 0.25, maybe slightly higher than that. Obviously, in an exam, they would give you a piece of graph paper that had the minor grid lines and you'd be able to write that more exactly. Finally, you should be aware of some potential sources of error. So these are things that are going to cause anomalous results, those being results that just don't fit our pattern and something has gone a little bit wrong. One of the ways that this could go wrong is if we have inaccurate concentrations of the solutions. So you think that this particular solution has a concentration of 0.6, but actually when you made it up, you didn't quite add enough of the solute and really the concentration is 0.5 and that would be reflected in our results. 
This could also happen if rather than it being human error and you adding the wrong amount of sugar or salt, just there's been some evaporation from the tubes. And that's going to mean that because they contain less water, their concentration is higher than it should be. Another thing that can happen is that if you haven't dried the chips of potato properly, then when you're measuring the mass at the end of the experiment, you're including extra water. And so you think that that piece of vegetable is heavier than it really is. And finally, it could just be that you have a balance that isn't weighing particularly accurately. That's all for this Osmosis Required Practical. So thank you very much for watching. And I hope that you found that a useful introduction to this topic. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to let me know in the comments below. And also don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Biology videos coming soon.